that on our original site. We're sitting on the same foundation. Um, the site part is really important because Euclid Avenue was the stagecoach route. And the Dunham's, after they arrived here in 1819, they started to figure out, hey, we're sitting on this major tavern and thoroughfare. Let's capitalize on that. Let's add on, open up this tavern, and there you go. So it's, it's an integral part of why we are still significant. We have, we're at a really transform, transformational point in our history. So uh, Dunham's came here in 1819, built the house in 1824. We're coming up on our bicentennial. Uh, operating tavern up until 1857 when the Dunham's retire. Private home for a little bit, specifically significant as a private home from the 1880 to 1930. That's when Millionaire's Row comes and goes, and Little Dunham Tavern is still sticking around as a witness to all this major change on the Good Avenue. And, and then we know more of what happens, you know, at mid-century, this landscape changes altogether completely again. We are still Little Dunham Tavern, but we're now surrounded by used car lots and a dry cleaners and gas stations and all of this industry. Um, and then, you know, the story of a lot of neighborhoods, especially in this area, white flight, great migration, redlining, disinvestment, neighborhoods have drastically changed and are still not recovered from that time. And now we're at this kind of new moment where there's a lot of de development again, specifically in this area. Um, you've probably seen Cleveland Foundation next door. Um, so there's, there's big things going on. And of all that history of Dunham that I just laid out, the, the private home part from 1880 to 1930, that's when it stops. And we became a museum in 1936. So we've got a really long history of being Dunham Tavern Museum. Um, I always will sing the praises of the volunteers, the board members, and the members that kept this tiny little institution going for all of that time, because it really is remarkable. However, I got here in 2018. I am the first executive director we've ever had. Not only that, I'm the first full-time staff member we've ever had. So this is a big leap forward, not like for me, exactly what well it is, but for, for this organization, it's a massive change in our culture to shift from uh, a more club mentality, to be honest with you, we were literally founded by the Society of Collectors, which is an antiques collecting club from the 1930s, it sort of doesn't get further away from where we're trying to be. We're literally dusting off the antiques and the model of an organization. Um, so that marks a really big shift where we're now trying to have, you know, be a staff-led organization with an advisory board. I'll let you know how that goes. Um, they're fine. They're really, they're great. Um, and, and not only that, but growing capacity. I have been here since, you know, 2018. I'm still a full-time staff of one which is not cute anymore, um, that sort of martyrdom has worn off. And so I'm really focused on raising capacity, adding staff. Um, I feel like we've spent a long time bringing money in and sending it right back out to outside professionals that come in for a moment, for a project, and then our sort of bottom line budget never really moves very much. This is a historically white-led organization in a predominantly black neighborhood, and one that's never really made an effort to reach our neighbors. There's physical barriers like fences and overgrowth, there's perceptual barriers too. So we have been working since even like the year before I got here, 27 key is when we really started to focus on this, to open up to our community, put them at the table with us to figure out what it is that they want out of this space, how we can be both this regional cultural destination, but also um, a neighborhood asset. I want to feel like your local park. Um, so I want the visitor who wants to come and tour the museum, and ask all the questions and go around a walking trail and read every single sign and label. But I also want the person who wants to throw a football out in the grass and walk their dog. So all of those visitor experiences should be relevant to this place. Um, so to that end, we last year completed a canvas-wide master plan. It's what's 
in this area. So it's not our job to tell the entire story of, of Cleveland history, but certainly hyper-locally we can be a space for more stories to be told, more narratives to be developed. Um, of course, everybody's mind goes pretty quickly to the Hub Uprising in 1966, which is valid, important history that should not be lost or forgotten. But it's not the only thing. There's a rich cultural history in this neighborhood as well. Anybody from Leo's Casino? Look up Leo's Casino. It's the last place that Otis Redding played before he died. The creams. Um, amazing. And there was an integrated club, black, white, everyone went out there. It was legendary. And it was down at East 78th Square. It's an oldie now. Um, we're working on finding that marker and getting that re erected. But there's lots of cool stories about this place to be told. And so it's not my job to tell all of them, but I can certainly facilitate that telling and be a repository for them while still lifting up the history of this kind of site itself. So kind of one place of possibility. You said, when was this facility, this part? Okay, so you're going to the museum, which is the, the tavern is the building out of the building. This is the barn. The barn uh, was built in the 1840s and burned down in 1963. So this is a new structure. It opened in 2000. Um, I say new, but our 23-year-old AC broke earlier, and you guys made it on the day install finished, and it's finally cool in here. So today this building feels very old. But um, so even though it is a modern, even though we have air conditioning, flush toilets, a kitchen, this post and beam construction is replica-ish of the original barn. Uh, the facade is the same, although we don't have working barn doors. We have just the regular door. And the footprint and the size is a little bit different. Part of this master plan, you can see the barn. We're right in the middle of the campus. So if you look there, you'll see that it's calling for a barn expansion. Um, all we know is that it will be in a northerly direction. So the size, the shape of it, we know what we're going for in capacity, but we still have a lot more study to do around that. And then behind that, Warford's Chester will be an event lawn so that ideally this space could open up to the outside and you can have entertainment that's indoors, outdoors, large gatherings, and also something that would be visible from Chester. So when people are going 45 miles an hour down it, they might like pause and look and say, hey, something's going on. So we build this as, you know, for our own programming, we do various monthly programs, fundraisers, etc. But we also we have community-based events like this. Um, and then we rent it out for whatever you want. Baby shower, weddings, retirement parties. Um, that's important income for, <laughs> for little museums. And that's what hurt during COVID. It's like, well, no one's having a gathering. And there was that budget line item. So it was, it's back to somewhat normal. A couple different iterations of that. So this, I'll admit it, mess behind me is uh, formerly our farm. Uh, most of it was leased to Cleveland Botanical Garden for the Green Corps program uh, since the 90s all the way up until 2019 when they ended that program. So it has not been farmed as that farm since 2018. Um, or 20, I guess 2019. So that's like top of the priority list. Um, but then yes, part of it also was we had our own market garden and some community garden plots in here. What is now overgrown and used to be a pumpkin patch most recently was also a community garden place at some point in time. Um, there's a long history of community gardening on this property. When I mentioned the Huff Uprising in the 60s, ladies here at Dunham were growing vegetables and canning salsa and selling it to fundraise to support the neighborhood and the rebuilding efforts that were going on there. So some kind of, and we know the Dunham's first thing they did when they got here was start clearing the land and farming. So productive landscape is definitely part of the story of this place for you know, hundreds of years. Um, first of all, when we talk about all these different gardens and tree plantings, all of that will be taking us back to a native non-invasive plant palette as much as possible. Um, there is also going to be a greenway. This Cleveland Foundation, we a lot. Um, there's going to be a large east-west greenway that's going through this area, and the building of their building meant that there was um, some big decisions to be made about stormwater management. So they built a large underground receptacle for stormwater, which will help us too. <laughs> I'm like, well, you do it, and I don't have to do it. Um, and and yeah, we want to be pollinator friendly. We um, have productive landscape as well, not just the farm but our orchard that's back here at Chester, the north 
east corner of the property and the one where the deer visited earlier today. Um, and then there's programming, the educational programming that we can build into that um, if I grow and stuff. <laughs> but partnered with, um, led by Midtown DV Tree Service and uh, Holden and Cleveland Botanical Garden, we had two, um, we call them grow and flow sessions. Um, one last November was sort of the kickoff, coming here in the barn, doing tree education, and talking about why the tree canopy is important, how we can link it to positive health outcomes, especially in disinvested neighborhoods. And it's part of our master plan to add to our tree canopy. So we were like, hey, we'll take, they had, Midtown had a goal to hit a certain number of plantings, and they hit it at this property. So we did some um, over on this lawn in November, and then just this past April, we did our, we had like 40 some volunteers come out from Flow and Grow. We started with yoga out on the lawn, which sounds fairly sweet, but I realized that you better stretch before you put trees in the ground. Like, it ended up being a key part of the day. Um, and then we got 20, 15 to 20 some trees in the ground, pre-dug holes, also a lesson I've learned the hard way. This time the holes were pre-dug, uh, but it's still a group effort to get a substantial, even if young, tree in the ground. And then we had a band, and we had a meal here in the barn, and it was about community, nature, sustainability, and education all in one. It just doesn't get better than that. It was a blast. Tell us about the little yellow house. Oh, the little yellow house. You might have seen that. You might have thought that was done in Tavern because it's on, if most people in Tavern Chester, they, they see that first. So that's the Banks Baldwin house. It is an 1876 little Jones Corner farmhouse that used to be located over on Ansel Road. It was moved to this property in the 90s. So it's already moved once and it's going to move again. Um, it was leased by Cleveland Botanical Garden for Green Corps. So they used that for like a classroom space or just like a kitchen and restroom with a support building um, and storage. But now they're not leasing it anymore because Green Corps is no more. And it is sitting on a portion of land that we have sold to Cleveland Foundation for this development project. So per that land sale agreement, they have to move it for us. And it will be moving over to this lawn, right, as you entered, it would have been to your right, there's a little lawn space adjacent to the museum. It's going to move there, and it's going to be open as a new visitor center. So, we've never been able to program that space ourselves. Um, you'll see when we go into the museum that I don't have a whole lot of um, extra space. It's sort of, you walk in, it's like, hi, here you are, sign up. So it'll be nice to have a little bit of a building with an accessible restroom, with a gift shop, you know, wait. Um, a, a nice welcome desk, a place for exhibits, um, people to orient themselves, learn a little more, tell a little bit more story, and then they can, you know, enter and go on a tour. So, that's one of my favorite things that's going to happen soon. If Bellingham Park was in the middle of that 